player evaluation using expected points added with NFL scrap. Ronald Yorko is an incoming statistics PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University. He received his BS in statistics at Carnegie Mellon in December 2015. At CMU, he co-founded with Mac Horowitz the Tartan Sports Analytic Club. Ron previously worked as a baseball operations data and analytic intern for the Pittsburgh, Pi Pittsburgh Pirates during the 2014 season, as well as a quantitative, quantitative analysis for financial services industry. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Ron Yurko. Today I'll be presenting work I've done with Sam Ventura and Max Horowitz on NFL player evaluation with expected points added using the NFL scraper package in R. So to get started, when we think of football, people typically think, okay, the football field. And we start to break up players and evaluate them based on yards. But if we think about, in this case, two different runs. First I have on a third and 20, David Johnson gains 11 yards on a halfback draw. What happens is fourth down still, team has to punt. Now in another case, we have a third and one, and I'm from Pittsburgh, so I'm gonna use the Steelers as an example. Le'Veon Bell gains four yards, converts the first down. So from a yards point of view, Johnson gained nearly three times as many yards as Le'Veon Bell. But obviously, not all yards are created equal. Bell's four yards converted the first down. There's more value there. So how do we value a play? So right here, we have the raw play-by-play -play of David Johnson's 11-yard run. As a statistician, I take this and I think of, I have a play-by-play -play data set. I know the down, I know the yards to go for the first down, I know the field position, where they're at on the field, and I know the time remaining. And all of this accounts for the situation. And the situation dictates the value of the play. Now what I'm talking about isn't new. We've known this for quite some time. And in fact, the first instance of this was actually in 1971, one of the first of many great BYU quarterbacks, Virgil Carter. He went on to a successful NFL career, and the Bears actually funded him for a master's, I believe at Northwestern. And what he did was he actually published a paper, Operations Research Journal, where he bucketed the football field and essentially came up with our first instance of expected points, averaging over the value of the next score across the field. The next then real deep dive into football stats was by the authors of The Hidden Game of Baseball. They wrote The Hidden Game of Football. And they expand upon the idea of Virgil Carter with a linear expected points model, starting from negative two on your own team's goal line and every 25 yards increasing by two points to positive six on your opponent's goal line. The other idea though that they really introduced is a play success is a function of the interaction between down and yards to go. If it's first and 10, we need to get at least four yards for a play to be considered a success. Is then another four yards on second and six means it's third and two. Another four yards means we got a first down. If we get less than that, we have to make up for it on another down. So they introduced this idea of, intera of the interactions between the situation variables. And of course, there's recent developments by members of Football Outsiders, Ryan Burke, used to be advanced football analytics, personal blog, now works for ESPN, and also number five. Now, all of the recent contributions are great, novel ideas, but the problem is they're all based on proprietary data, they're not open source, so as a lowly first year stats PhD student without really any money, I can't access any of these things, and I want to recreate it on my own. So what's the solution? Introducing NFL Scraper. This is an R package by Max Horowitz addressing this need. What this is, is it accesses NFL.com's API, scrapes the play-by-play -play data, it's there for us freely, available to use, and gets it into a tidy format so we can do our own analysis. The whole point is to create a community that exists already in baseball analytics to sort of drive more research in football. You can easily install it, if, I don't know if the podium's in the way, we can we Google NFL Scraper or GitHub, install it, and do your own analysis. So, in terms of then modeling expected points with NFL Scraper, we think of then the distribution of the type of next score in the half for each play. 
So this x-axis is these number of plays, and the y-axis shows each of the different types of next scoring events. And it's color-coded by blue being for the team with possession, red being the opponent with respect to the team that has possession of the ball. So what we see here is clearly that, okay, it's an offensive-driven game. Primarily, team with possession is scoring more. But the important thing is we're only looking at seven types of events. This is really, in statistics, a classification problem. So naturally, what we introduced then was a multinomial logistic regression model, predicting then the probability for each of these events for the play of consideration. So using this model, we're generating these probabilities. We actually don't care that we're assigning a touchdown to be seven or a field goal to be three, a safety to be two. We can tune that afterwards if we want. But what we're doing to calculate expected points is we take probability of a touchdown given that it's third and 20 on our own 10 yard line with 10 minutes, 58 seconds remaining. We multiply that, that by our value of seven and then we add that together with the other probabilities for each of the different events. That then gives us our expected points for a play. Then we can actually calculate a value for the play given the started expected points for the play Subtract that from the expected points at the start of the next play gives us our expected points added for a play. The, the value contribution from the result of that play. So back to our example, David Johnson's 11 yards leading to a fourth down. Only .0096 expected points added. Meanwhile, Le'Veon Bell's four yards, .9225 expected points added. In terms of point value, his four yards are 100 times more valuable than David Johnson's 11s. And this makes sense, he got the first down. It's much more important than just a halfback draw. Gaining slight, that's why this value is positive because it's slightly better field position in terms of then the punt on the next play. But Le'Veon Bell continued the drive. So now what? We have this expected points added and now we can calculate different metrics. We total up, make rate measures, and it also can introduce new weighted metrics. So I've been throwing a bunch of text at you so now I'm going to do a bunch of charts, right? Next series of slides. Well, actually, I kind of like These charts are all text. They're text of different players. Anyway, so x-axis, we have our pass attempts. Y-axis, total expected points added for quarterbacks in 2016. What we can see here, Matt Ryan, MVP last year. By far, highest total, point, ex total expected points added of any quarterback last season. But this is a counting stat. So it's a function of playing time, right? Guys with more pass attempts are ultimately going to have higher expected points added than quarterbacks with lower pass attempts. So we look at this on a rate level. We divide it by the number of attempts. We see some interesting things going on here. So in terms of last year, from an EPA per attempt basis, Jimmy Garoppolo, the backup Patriots quarterback, actually is in the same tier as Matt Ryan. And the Browns quarterback, Cody Kessler, He's on the same level as Tom Brady and Dak Prescott. And we also see this red line showing the zero, so everybody below is actually averaging negative expected points added for each of the attempts. Brock Osweiler, who was historically bad last year, he was really bad, as well as Ryan Fitzpatrick. And Jared Goff is consistently the worst quarterback by all measure across the board. He's a rookie though, so give him some time. Another measure is success rate. This was Brian Burke evolved the idea introduced in the game of football and came up with just measuring the percentage of plays with positive expected points added. So x-axis we have success rate, y-axis the expected points added per attempt, and obviously there's a relationship. Guys with a higher success rate are going to have higher expected points added per attempt. But this can kind of give us an idea of maybe Jimmy Garoppolo has the same success rate as Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, but a much higher EPA per attempt. So maybe next year we can consider if Jimmy G just gets some playing time for whatever reason, it's probably going to come back down to earth. Same with Matt Ryan. Might have overachieved somewhat last year for maybe slightly lucky big plays. And now also using the expected points added, we can introduce new metrics. What I have here is this idea of a weighted completion percentage. So if you think completion percentage, it's kind of like batting average. We're treating all completed passes equal. We're also treating all incomplete passes equal. But we know that's not true. 
Some complete passes gain 30 yards and they're on a third down. Other complete passes only gain two on a first down. Also, we have incomplete passes that could be on a first and 10 on your opponent's goal line versus an incomplete pass on third and one. So weighted completion percentage takes that in consideration. So an example here is Joe Flacco, Nick Foles. Their completion percentage is over 65%. But in terms of value, bang for your buck, Jameis Winston, Josh McCown, Cam Newton, are actually providing more value to their team. And similarly, one guy I'd just like to point out here is Colin Kaepernick as well. It's not great necessarily, but somewhat along the lines of average. Just keep that in mind as I keep going through. And we're obviously not just limited to quarterbacks, we'll get receiving as well. So what I've defined here is a weighted reception percentage. Same idea as weighted completion percentage. We're weighting caught passes by the EPA. So what we have here, x-axis reception percentage, the y-axis is weighted. We actually can see groupings forming. We have running backs on, these, on the high reception percentage end, but low weighted reception percentage. So LaShawn McCoy, Todd Gurley, TJ Yeldon, they have a high reception percentage, but they're not really adding much value. So think of those short little passes that are maybe only gaining two yards, three yards, or even say on similar situations as David Johnson's run on the third and 20. They're, they're completed passes that aren't providing anything. An outlier though from this is Le'Veon Bell, who's this high reception percentage, but he has a similar weighted to big play receivers, such as Dez Bryant, Terrell Pryor, Marvin Jones. And another group we have forming is tight ends with high value and also a relatively high reception percentage. Dwayne Allen, Hunter Henry, uh, Travis Kelsey, Eric Abron. And one guy I always like to point out, little Cole Beasley, definitely you know, providing value to the Cowboys there. Now next is rushing. So there's a few interesting things going on with rushing. Y-axis, I have the expected points added per carry, X-axis, number of carries. Ezekiel Elliott, he had most number of carries and slightly positive value here. One, the first thing I want to point out is quarterbacks. So what we see actually is quarterbacks have the most efficient runs. This makes sense from the point of view of usually when they're running, it's not necessarily by design, it's on plays where it's broken down, but Aaron Rodgers can scramble and he can convert the first down. So that's providing a lot of value. Colin Kaepernick as well he provided a lot of value to his team from running. Another guy I'd like to point out is Mike Gillisley. He was actually the best running back last year. He's on the Buffalo Bills from an expected points added point of view. And unfortunately for Buffalo fans and anybody else in the AFC East, he got signed by the Patriots this offseason. So maybe that's a good sign that my stats are working, that Bill Belichick is somewhat in agreement then. But the, one of the main takeaways from running is that you know, this red line shows the zero line. All these players are actually averaging negative expected points added per attempt. So on a league average basis, using each of the seasons, we find the league average expected points added per attempt comparing passing to rushing, it's actually increasing each season for passing. Meanwhile, rushing is below the zero line. So in terms of evaluating players, from expected points added point of view, rushing is inefficient. So it's not necessarily a running back's fault that given when they're, they're being used, that their EPA value is negative. Really, to judge them, we should look at some sort of baseline. So we should really consider then the league average in terms of its evaluation. Because rushing is just inefficient compared to passing. This makes sense if you think of all the plays, even going back to the hidden game football's idea of success. On a first and ten, running back carries the ball, Frank Gore gets the ball, and only gets two, three yards. That's not actually a successful play. So one thing I want to talk about then Using NFL Scraper, we actually know where each play was out in the field, and we know the location, whether it was left, middle, or right. So we can generate then a, a heat field for each of these different types of metrics. All right, so along the bottom, I hope the Titan's not in the way. I know where it's left, middle, or right, and then I bucket the field based on 10 yard line. So starting on our own end zone, one to nine yard line, keep going, middle of the field, to our opponent's end zone, the 10 to one. 
what I have here is the EPA per attempt relative to average for Peyton Manning in 2014, 2015. So red being hot, blue being cool, gray being average. What we can see on the left, Peyton Manning, there's a lot more red across the field versus 2015, his down year where he was also hurt. So the white numbers are also the number of attempts. So we see less attempts for Peyton Manning in 2015. There's a lot more blue. He was worse than average across the field in 2015 versus in 2014. Another example of showing how you can see this field good point of view is comparing Antonio Brown, Pittsburgh Steelers wide receiver, who is pretty much better than average across the field versus what is now the Los Angeles Chargers tight end Hunter Henry, whose primary value is up near the opponent's end zone. He's a touchdown target in the red zone. Versus on his own side of the field, he has less targets. He's not really providing as much value. So one thing that really gets talked about in football stats is how many attempts do we really need to know so we can trust like Dak Prescott's results? When can I believe the stats? When do these stats stabilize? So an idea I'm following is an approach by Tom Tango, who is legendary in baseball statistics and hockey stats now. And what I'm taking is for a given number of attempts, I find all players with at least that number. So say 200 pass attempts. I then create two samples, so 100 each for each player, calculate the stat on each. Do this several times to sort of get this idea to converge, compute the correlation, and see how this correlation changes as I increase this number of attempts. So first example, very clean example, is receiving metrics. And what we see here on a target basis, the number of target goes up, or see our correlation, it keeps rising, kind of hits a stabilization point around 200, about 300 targets for each of these. Reception percentage actually stabilizes the fastest, and then we have our weighted reception percentage and success rate that follows. On a reception level basis, both expected points added per reception and yards per reception reach very high levels of correlation. Next for passing, what we see is completion percentage and success rate being the best metrics from the stabilizing point of view. They keep rising and reaching high levels of correlation. Meanwhile, our traditional metrics are very low. Rushing, we see something very interesting going on. Success rate is by far the highest level of correlations, but we see it goes back down. This is kind of like a survivorship bias. The guys that are getting this number of carries might be getting, you know, they're old, changing teams. So maybe it's not as dependent upon them. So really, if I want a metric, on a season to season level basis, I want high correlations whether they're on the same team or if they change teams, because then that means it's actually tribute to that player's ability. So what we have here, left side's different teams, right side same teams, and these are receiving metrics. So we see is receivers actually have high level of correlations across different stats on a season to season basis. We can really judge receivers by their metrics, even when they're on different teams, versus when we look at quarterbacks, when they're on the same team, we could see higher levels of correlations for completion percentage and success rate, but when they change teams, it goes down and things get a little bit strange. And one thing that's noticeable is in 2014, 2015 season, all metrics but completion percentage notice a big time drop in correlation. And it was actually driven by historically low years for Peyton Manning, Tony Romo. But for rushing, when they're on the same team, success rates high level correlation. But what we see, all stats when players change teams, there's just no predictability at all. And this kind of really a sign. Rushing metrics, pretty dependent upon the team, probably due to the O-line. One example is DeMarco Murray, when he was on the Cowboys in 2014. Great season, 43% success rate. Change teams go to Philadelphia, success rate drops by 34%. Completely different style of offense, completely different O-line, different results. So just to recap, traditional metrics, they're not actually properly evaluating a play. We use NFL Scraper, we calculate the expected points added. We actually have provided in the package, we can download the data to get the expected points added for every play, get the win probability added as well. And what we see is that passing is more efficient from expected point, point of view. These are just some of the metrics 
that are much more consistent for each of these types of levels. Going forward, in terms of isolating a player contribution, so obviously one player is not completely responsible for the expected points added, we need to account for the situation, we need to account for the people involved. So really, that's a mixed model approach, which is a talk I'm actually looking forward to later today. But the idea is we have fixed effects for a situation, random effects for each of the individual players and teams. This is actually the work we are presenting at Nessus come September. And we also, using our model, have the probabilities for each of the events. So what I have here on the y-axis, probability of touchdown out of per attempt versus the success rate. So we have guys, Matt Moore, Jimmy Garoppolo, who exceeded their success rate in terms of this probability of touchdown added. But I can do this for each of the different types of scoring events. Probably a field goal added. That might be a measure of more getting into scoring position. So this is something we're going to keep looking at. And with that, I encourage you to check out the Torrent Sports Analytics website, where we're going to be posting markdown files, shiny apps to you know, visualization so you can see this. Follow the GitHub development and us on Twitter for just to throw this out there, if you have not done so, you're at a university, I strongly encourage you to start a sports analytics club. We're able to get students and professors involved on just fun research. So with that, thank you, and any questions? Ron, have you guys started to, uh, you said you're looking at a fixed effect model. Um, yeah. Do I turn it on? I mean, will that account for situations where a team is trying to run out the clock? And, and so, I mean, you, you think about um, a football game over the course of a game, and there are some teams, um, maybe not the Steelers anymore, but they used to be this way, where we're going to run and run and run mm -hmm. to wear you down to the point when it comes late in the game, you're tired, we're not. Um, yeah. And that happens less today, but is that going to be in the new analysis? So one thing we do for our model, expected points model, and we're going to take a similar approach to this mixed model, is the weighting of observations by the score differential. That takes into consideration. So if the, if the game's out of hand, probably then the team is wanting to drive, you know, just keep running to run out the clock. We take that less into consideration in the model. That has less weight. So that's one way of addressing it. And, uh, but yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And, and then I assume you'll look at team philosophy as well. As yeah, yeah, we'll, we're gonna consider like, team tendencies. And hopefully then when we look at those random effects, the teams can kind of account for the fact that you know, Patriots probably some fact of just better play calling, right, than other teams in terms of that value. I mean, that's an excellent point. You think about the Patriots, and um, everyone's been saying you know, calling Tom Brady GOAT, which I think is ridiculous because if you were a general manager putting the team together for one year, you'd be taking either Rodgers or, or Ryan, um, mm -hmm. some of your data laid that out. Um, but they do something special. Yeah, Bill Belichick himself. Yeah, so I mean, do you need a for Belichick variable? Or, <laughs> yeah, it's something to keep in mind, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Think about coaches as random effects. Yeah, it would be interesting. Yeah. So you, what, what thoughts have you had for divvying the, the shares up? So like, the ex so Matt Ryan gets all these expected points added, but clearly also Julio Jones, for example, yeah. gets all these expected points added, and 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 there's like if you look at most metrics, right? Those, those two are like correlated significantly, and so like the question isn't necessarily how good. I mean, looking at that with Matt Ryan in like a vacuum is kind of I think a bit. I mean, yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, yeah. So that's why our what we're doing is we're going to do this on the play level, right? So yeah. we know then for every play, who the opponent's defense is, who's the passer, who's the receiver. So we want to account for the fact that, you know, if Matt Ryan's throwing to Julio Jones versus when Matt Ryan throws to other guys then, that's why the model will take that into consideration, the results of plays when he's not throwing to Julio Jones. Or even then across for different quarterbacks, right? And, uh, right, because so, the Garoppolo Brady thing I think would is that are Garoppolo's expected points just because of the players that he, like the Gronkowski's and the Edelman's and things like that, or is it, is it, you're right, is it the, is, is it just him, for yeah. example? Yeah, yeah that's, that's what we're hoping to achieve with that, the mixed model approach. Yeah. Any other questions? So the David Johnson run, yeah. are there any, are there any numbers around expected points saved? Like, so is there really evidence behind that? 
play call in that situation. So, uh, third so and 20, a run for 11 yards versus actually trying to achieve the first down. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. If we would like take into maybe model a defensive of offensive play, right? Yeah, or what's the chances that given this play call, we convert the first down with the passing play first, right? And then we can see like an expected payoff then. That's, that's an interesting idea. So we haven't looked at that, but keep that in mind. Well, there's got to be some, right? That you see that, especially in the children's days, right? Of the Vikings, but um, <laughs> um, just not the, you know, not taking any risks at all. Yeah, one thing we see with football analytics is a lot of it's driven by a fantasy football community. And that's really not what this is about. This is trying to get at where's value in players, right? And from what you're talking about, it's an idea of maybe we should do a mixed model for the expected points for every team, their own model, right? Because expected points for the Patriots is a lot different than the expected points for the Cleveland Browns. Right? And I always bash on the Browns and for Pittsburgh. But, uh, but th that's an idea to keep in mind, like, okay, we should expect that the Patriots probably have a much higher likelihood than scoring a touchdown given a certain opponent versus say when the Browns do against the Denver Broncos. Anything else? All right. We'd like to thank Ron for sharing his knowledge and expertise.